does your husband look at pornography? If so, you're not alone. According to statistics, almost half of Christian families say that porn is a major problem in their home. Today we are talking to Jen Ferguson, author of the book, Pure Eyes, Clean Heart, A Couple's Journey to Freedom from Pornography. In this interview, Jen is sharing a little bit about her story as she and her husband have had to walk this battle over the last few years, as well as just a wealth of knowledge and strategies that you can use to fight porn in your home. She's sharing not only as a godly wife how you can support your husband and help him towards wholeness, how you can restore your relationship, as well as how you can help your children to stay out of this trap. Plus, Jen is actually giving away a copy of her book and a copy of the prayer cards that she's gonna mention later in this interview. So definitely stay tuned to the end to find out how you can enter this giveaway. All right. Well, today on the podcast, we are so excited to be able to talk to Jen Ferguson, author of the book, Pure Eyes, Clean Heart, A Couple's Journey to Freedom from Pornography. Welcome to the podcast, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. So just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your family and your background? Craig and I have been married for 18 years. We actually, I met him when I was 19 years old. And we ended up getting engaged after only 11 days of dating. So that was crazy. But um, we actually waited two years to get married. So um, we have two kids, almost two teenagers. I know that the topic of your book is about a couple's journey through pornography. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? You know, when we were dating, which was, you know, or engaged, I should say, I actually asked Craig, and this was in like probably 1999, if he ever looked at porn. And I'm not quite sure what motivated me to ask that question. Um, and he was like, oh, you know, all guys do it, but we're about to get married. It's not going to be an issue. And I was like, okay, because I was like 20 years old and, and didn't know that pornography could be something that uh, is addictive or that's a, a problem. And I also believed, well, pornography is about sex. So if he can have sex all the time, um, then it's not going to matter. And so the first year we were married was just, it was stressful. We were both commuting opposite directions every day. We also had a big medical scare the day we got back from our honeymoon. So the stress level of our first year of marriage was really high. And I just started to notice these small little things. Like whenever I would walk into the room, he would quickly close his computer window tab. There was a stain on our computer chair. At one point, um, like we had no money, right? It was our first year married and I was still finishing up school. And I remember getting a bill from the cable company and there was a pay-per-view charge on there. And I happened to call the cable company when he was home. Craig was like, oh no, that was just some samurai movie that I was watching. And it ended up like, you know, years later, I find out that's not the case. So there are all these clues, but it actually wasn't until that second year of our marriage that I was on our shared computer at home and I saw some of the websites that he had been looking at. And so in that moment, it was like, okay, I'm not crazy. This was actually happening. So I felt that vindication, but at the same time, I felt so sad and so angry and so betrayed. And so I immediately called him into the room and I was like, what is this? What's going on? And he said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. I know I shouldn't. And I thought that was it. Because for me, I was like, if I get caught doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing, like that's a big motivator for me to stop doing it. But because of the nature of pornography and it's an addiction, and so fearing that you're going to get caught just isn't enough to help you change and to heal and to overcome that addiction. So after he got caught, then what did that look like in the aftermath? How was the early process of going through that? What did that look like? I think at the beginning, I would, you know, maybe ask him every once in a while, because it was still kind of just lingering in the back of my mind. But it wasn't until I started um, catching him on more of a routine basis, that I realized the severity of the problem. And at that same time, I realized that this was not something that he could overcome by himself. I realized that this was not something that was related to sex. 
And slowly, over many years, I realized that this was not even related to me. I think a lot of women, when they find out that their husband's looking at porn, either if their husband confesses or if they find you know, stuff on the phone or on the computer, your first response is, well, why am I not enough? Or if I looked like this, would he? Or if I acted like this, would he? Or if I talked like this, would he? And so slowly, God just showed me, I think through talking about it with Craig, like what, what motivates you to do this? And so at that point, we realized porn is really not about sex. Porn is about escape and fantasy. And so, um, you know, Craig came to realize that he was incredibly fearful of being rejected. Craig was incredibly fearful of not having what it takes to do what he was supposed to do or to be the man that he felt like he was supposed to be. Um, all of this like kind of childhood wounds were manifesting themselves in pornography. And I think porn is, is a whole filler. Like we all, we kind of, it's kind of a cl Christian cliche a little bit uh, to say that we all have a hole in our heart that only Jesus can fill, but cliche or not, it's true, right? Jesus creates us to desire him and to have relationship with him. And when we start using other things to fill that hole, whether it's pornography, whether it's food, whether it's shopping and money, whether it's drugs or alcohol, all of those things we are those quick fixes that we use to numb the pain or escape reality because reality is too much. And so Craig used porn when reality got to be too much. And we just kind of talked through a lot. We talked a lot, and um, which was so helpful um, one, because neither one of us felt alone. We at least had each other, even though what we were journeying through would have been so helpful to have a community of other people around us. I was watching a video about addiction a couple of months ago, and it said something so profound, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And so I think in us unpacking each other um, stuff, because I didn't, I wasn't just passive in this, whole experience. I got very, very controlling. I thought the solution was to give Craig rules and to make him live in a box that, <laughs> that where I could securely monitor all of his internet activity. And um, that created a lot of mistrust in our relationship. And so through talking all of that out, we really formed a very strong connection. And the more we're connected with our spouses, with other people in healthy relationships, and with Jesus, for sure, the less likely we are to need to, re to rely on those whole fillers. That's so interesting how you talk about kind of the reason behind the behavior. So can you just give us a little bit of insight of how do you have these conversations? What kind of questions can you start to get him to open up to try to figure out what the root causes are, particularly when he might not even know what they are? Right. And, you know, a lot of guys grow up believing because they're taught, don't be emotional. It's all logical. It is what it is. And they don't know, they don't grow up figuring out how to go deeper to, to realize, okay, I have a behavior and there's something in me that is motivating that behavior. And honestly, I think there's a lot of women that are like that too. We have such full lives and it takes time to dig back there. It takes courage to dig back there. But if we truly want to change, then we have to be willing to go back. And so I would say first step is to pray. If you um, are, if you and your spouse are wanting to unpack some of that emotional um, baggage and, and really ask God to heal those emotional wounds that are motivating the behavior, starting with prayer is so amazing because really the Holy Spirit is what helps us see beyond what our eyes can physically see, right? And um, and so I would start with prayer. And if, if your spouse isn't open to praying with you, praying by yourself and just say, okay, Jesus, like I want to walk in and I want to have this conversation, but I want it to be productive. I want it to be loving. God, protect my heart for not taking things personally that he says. And, um, so, you know, some of us are internal processors and that means we have to think inside of our head. And once we've thought about it, then we can actually talk talk it out. Others of us are external processors, and so the first couple of things that we say may not actually be the truth, but we have to get all of our words out before we figure out what is actually um, worth hanging on to and, and the truth. So asking Jesus to go before you and, and blessing that conversation and giving you wisdom and insight and asking him to just drive that conversation 
And I think uh, really getting to know more about each other's upbringing and the uh, relationships that they have with their parents or other people is so, um, so helpful, right? And then you can kind of start like, hey, tell me about your relationship with your dad. How present was he when you were growing up? What are some of the things that he taught you to believe about yourself? Another conversation like, hey, tell me about your mom. Like, what? Or if you feel like, if especially if um, one of the most helpful conversations is after you have um, maybe you've caught him again or caught her again because women can be addicted to porn. It doesn't always. Um, sometimes it's visual images, but it's also reading uh, really um, graphic romance novels or even watching like some of the R-rated movies these days are just crazy with the, uh, right, with the, the, the sex scenes and everything. And, but, um, hey, what motivated you to do that right then? What were you feeling? What happened right before that? And oftentimes there's these little triggers that happen. Like maybe his boss just told him that he did a bad job on the project. Or maybe he had a hard conversation with his mom. Maybe he was feeling less than because of, you know, whatever. But even if it's something that you said, like the, like I said, we never have an excuse to sin, right? So it's always our choice to engage or, or not engage. So this isn't about casting blame or finding fault or figuring out who started it. This is about digging deep and say, what is hurting you that's motivating you to find comfort? And instead of how can we rewire our brains that instead of seeking pornography or food or drugs or alcohol or shopping, to bring you comfort? How can we let true relationship and intimacy and connection bring you comfort? So I'm sure as you're having these conversations with your husband, this has to be a process that takes quite a bit of time as you're just unpacking and uncovering everything that, you know, both of you probably don't even know or realize about yourselves and each other. How do you avoid being controlling in the meantime? I think that uh, it's a fine line. I know for me, I am very motivated by fear. And I'm just something that I struggle with right now. Like not um, not about pornography and Craig anymore because we've been through all of this for so many years. <laughs> um, and, and he really truly is free from that addiction. But in a lot of areas in my life, fear usually compels or propels me to act a certain way. There's a difference between when I am compelled by fear And when the Holy Spirit's like, hey, why don't you check in? There have been times because I was so controlling and tried to put Craig in a box and that did not um, bear any fruit in our relationship at all. I said, okay, Jesus, if you need me to intervene, if you need me to ask him a question, if you need me to kind of interrupt the temptation process, then I need you to show me. And there were probably three or four nights where Jesus actually woke me up or the Holy Spirit woke me up and said, hey, you need to go get him. And those are really not fun places to be, but I would much rather rely on Jesus. And I don't think that he called me into every situation either. Um, So it wasn't like I was the sole one responsible for keeping Craig safe because I I can't. And that's what I want you to know is that you do not have the responsibility for keeping someone away from pornography. All you can do is be a helper and be an encourager and um, have healthy boundaries for you. It's definitely like Craig knew at all times. Pornography was never okay with me. But I also had to realize that this was an addiction. And as long as I saw him making some sort of progress, then I had to be okay with the fact that he was going to stumble and fall, just like I can fall into very controlling behaviors and let my fear rule. He was letting his temptation rule. And um, so, you know, there's, there's filtering software you can install on the computer. You can get an accountability partner. Uh, if you're going to get an accountability partner, then it needs to be someone who's actually going to check in on a real level, not just, hey, man, did you look at porn this week? No? Okay. I mean, because you can fake it. You can join Sex Addicts Anonymous. You can go to counseling. Like, all of those things are really good things to do, but praying and say, okay, God, what is it that you want to use to free me? Or what is it that you want to use to free my spouse from this? How can we uh, move through this process as quickly as possible, but with real, real healing? The breaking point for me is when I thought I had done every single thing that I could possibly do to keep him from porn and he still 
I still caught him looking at it. And that was the day that I shut myself in my bathroom closet, got as far away as I could. And I was like, I do not know what the hell you're doing, God. And I don't know why you thought that I could handle this or that I would even like know how to get out of this or, you know, why would you do this to me? And at that moment, when I got to my breaking point, when I was so exhausted, trying to be a mom, not only to my own kids, but also to mother my husband, I couldn't do it anymore. And that was when God said, would you like to try it my way? Let me ask you another question. As you're going through this, and I'm sure it's not easy, and like you said, it's a process that takes time. What did you do or what would you recommend that somebody should do to kind of help take care of themselves and guard their heart as they're walking through this process? There are things that I did and then things that I wish I would have done. I think for me, what I did is I pressed into Jesus and really developing my own relationship with him because it would have been really easy. And I did fall into this where I just let bitterness and resentment grow. And it got so big and I became so demeaning toward Craig and treating him like a little kid almost. And um, like whenever he would do something that hurt my feelings or whenever he didn't do something I asked him to do, not only was I angry about that one thing, but it also like had all encapsulated all my anger from all the porn stuff too, right? So it was like this little, little thing that he would do and he would just get this avalanche of anger. And so that's one of the things that I didn't do well with, um, as well with, I think, because I didn't have a community of trusted people that I could really go to and say, my husband is breaking my heart. I don't know what to do. You know, I need someone to, to help me along this process. And so I think reaching out to someone, I think tell your spouse, hey, like, can I have your permission to tell whoever um, that this is going on because I need support? And you're asking permission in the sense that you don't want to tell his story, right? Like, you can only tell your own story. But things with, like, addiction, you have to have a community around you to support you through that. And so if he's not okay with you talking to a friend, say, okay, well, give me permission to talk to someone because it's not an option. Like my boundary is I need to be able to have a safe space to talk about this. So do you need to go to counseling? Do you need to go to your pastor? Do you need to go to your women's ministry leader? Someone who is, um, will assure your confidence, um, confidentiality, so that you can start to build that. But also encouraging him or your, whoever, if you're the husband, but your wife, your spouse, to talk about their problem with someone who is also trusted. So finding a CSAT counselor who believes that, which is CSAT, it's the Certified Sex Addiction Therapist, make sure you find one that believes that pornography is not helpful because there are some that um, don't believe that. But finding someone that can shepherd you through this, that can help you unpack um, and to help you deal with, cause it's not like life stops when you're dealing with your pornography addiction. So you're still having to manage everything else. And so all of those other things, plus dealing with addiction is huge. And in Galatians six, it talks about sharing each other's burdens. It says, yes, everyone's supposed to carry their own load like that. And God designed you to be able to carry your own stuff like that fits in a backpack. But when you're dealing with addiction, it's like carrying around a humongous boulder, on your back and you just physically cannot go through life carrying a boulder and doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing and that's when he's saying you have to rely on community to help you carry this so that you can make it through to the other side and be healthy and be happy and then be a light for other people who are going through the same thing so in addition to finding community with those around you either friends family, people at church. I know that there are some really good resources out there like books to help people. And I know you have a book, Pure Eyes, Clean Heart. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book? Basically what your book is about, who it's for, how it helps. We basically just opened up our life and shared our story, our whole progress from beginning to end. Um, And not an end is, you know, when you're in recovery, like when you're with addicted, like there's always going to be a little bit, Satan knows that he can use that. In fact, the other day, uh, we, we, our family has been going through a lot right now. And so I feel like Satan's pulling out all the stops <laughs> to try to keep us living in fear or um, just derailing uh, the path that God has us on. 
And Craig even said, yeah, you know, like I even had this little pornography itch. And he was like, I was able to swat it away. But you have to be real. Like this is always probably going to be somewhat of a temptation for you. And so, um, so we just wrote out our story and said, this is what we dealt with. These are the things we talked about. These are the resources that we used. And then every third chapter, we took whatever we were sharing about and made it applicable to the couples, giving, giving y'all some real meat to chew on and digest and then talk about with each other. And there are even discussion questions so you kind of help you work through. Because the truth is, it is awkward and it is hard to just start a conversation about pornography. Um, easier for some than, than others, depending on how you grew up and what was considered taboo. But there's a lot of people that can't even, like husbands and wives that can't even talk about sex and what you enjoy and what you don't want. And so opening up that conversation really breeds intimacy. Like you are standing raw in front of each other and, and bearing your heart to, to one another. And so that's kind of our, what we did and how our uh, book unfolds to so just share that journey. Your book sounds so helpful, especially in that regard of getting in to really talk about issues. But what about for a couple who's just really hurt and bitter and isn't even at the point where they can sit down and have a civil conversation to talk about these kinds of things? What advice would you have for them of, you know, building up their relationship just to get to the point where they can kind of start to deal with this sort of thing? knowledge is incredibly powerful so once you understand what you're dealing with and if you can kind of separate yourself from like pretend like zoom out a little bit right from especially if you're the one that's been betrayed and you have so much hurt and bitterness i just want to tell you your hurt and your bitterness and your um your pain is valid like you have been wronged period and that and it's good for you to hear that validation but if you choose to stay in that hurt and pain and bitterness and close yourself off, you are bringing a tremendous amount of hurt and pain to you. Like you are doing yourself a disservice. And I think that, um, you know, it's kind of the nature of marriage in our society right now. It's very easy to take that hurt and bitterness and say, this is all about me. You did something wrong. You hurt me. And so I'm just going to hang on to this so that I can protect myself from future hurt. But if you're sitting over here hurt, and then you know that your spouse is sitting over here hurt, because I guarantee you that no matter what your spouse says, unless, you know, he has some really, really deep mental and emotional um, disease or illness, he does not want to keep hurting you. And he feels very trapped and very inadequate to stop doing the thing that is destroying your marriage. So believing the best in that, okay, I think my spouse really does want to make a change and he has no idea, nor does he even know where to start on how to make that a reality. And so I think once you realize that when someone's acting out of their own hurt, it gives you a new perspective. It helps you to be a little bit more selfless and a little bit less self-focused and realizing, okay, maybe my purpose in this marriage for this moment in time is to come alongside my spouse and help him to heal from that hurt. And it's gonna be this kind of uh, almost like exchange. Sometimes your spouse, even though he's hurting because of his porn stuff and dealing with that emotional wound, he's gonna have to put himself aside and realize that today's your day to deal with your stuff. And maybe you need to ask those hard questions like, you know, this is how, when you use porn, this is how it makes me feel. Because he needs to know that. Like, you can't hide that. It's not about, um, this is not about stuffing your feelings to help him because that just creates a whole another mess in your relationship. But ex understanding that pornography has hurt both of you. And so you can either stay on opposite sides of the field or you can come together and play on the same team. That's powerful. Um, let me ask you this. Are there really bad pieces of advice out there that people should know to watch out for? Or are there any really common pitfalls that a lot of people going through this deal with that they should know to avoid? Yeah, I think one um, is that pornography or addiction is just about behavior. So, and that if you were strong enough, you could just deal with it on your own. I think that, um, Overcoming addiction takes relationship with Jesus. It takes relationship with other people. It's never 
your fault. You are not the responsible for your, your spouse's decisions. Um, it is not about what you look like or how you act or what you do or you don't do in bed. This is not something that you should keep to yourself. You need to have safe spaces to work this out. Um, this is not something that boys just do or men just do uh, to learn how to be a man. The sex education by pornography is the worst idea ever in the history of man mankind. Maybe not the worst, but pretty bad. Like since it's something that we don't talk about very much, it seems like, oh, you know, it'd be really easy to think, oh, it's just me. Oh, it's just my family. And I'm sure all of my friends don't also deal with this. But I know that you have some stats on how many people actually do deal with pornography. Do you remember what those are? It's way over the 50% range. Even the number of pastors that are ensnared in pornography is just, it's mind boggling. And uh, so that's kind of, that is hard because a lot of pastors are not equipped to handle this because they, they know what to say, the right words to say, but um, they're struggling within their hearts too. Uh, but and even the number of women who are being ensnared in pornography is also rising. I think I read like 30% of women ha are at least watching or engaging with pornography on a monthly basis. So it, the problem is so real and it's so prevalent. And I do a lot of writing now for um, parents with children trying to keep them safe from pornography. And there are there's this website, which is phenomenal. I really recommend it. It's called bythenewdrug.org. And they have said that kids as young as eight years old are emailing them and asking for help. I oh, I hate that it is something that we have to deal with with our kids also. My oldest is quickly getting to that age and we've already started to have some of these conversations of do we look at naked people on the computer and like at this point he doesn't even realize that that's a thing and I don't want to tell him and like put ideas in his head um, that that is something that's a thing that could be gone and looked for. Um, but you don't want to like avoid it either so that they're completely unprepared because they do have friends, um, other kids who know about this stuff. So what advice would you give someone who has kids about this age? You said that you have teenagers. What can we as parents do to help keep our kids out of this? Well, one of the websites that I write for is called Protect Young Minds. And the person who started that website actually wrote two books called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, and the other one is Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, Junior. So the junior one I think is three to five, and or maybe three to seven, and then the other one is um, seven and up. And they're picture books that talk about what pornography is in such um, great understandable language so it doesn't freak out the kids. Like we don't want to take all of our fear about pornography and just put it on our children. We want to empower them that when they, if and when, and it's really not if anymore, sadly to say, when they see things that are inappropriate and not good for them, these books give them, it's called the can-do plan, and it gives them tools of, and it kind of a, 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 a mnemonic device, right? It's like, okay, if I see this, this is what I can do. And it encourages them and empowers them to make good choices. And I think that our generation didn't have that they didn't talk about it like and and it was so um it was accessible but not as accessible as it is now and even and the sad thing is too we can I, like my kids have uh, parental restrictions on their phone they can only go to um certain websites and but the truth is is that only goes so far and technology is getting um more and more advanced that a kids can get around them if they really want to or B, the companies that are producing this are getting trickier and sneakier, sneakier. So your kid may not even be, I mean, in most cases, your kids are not intentionally seeking out pornography, but they mistype one letter and boom, they're at a site that they're not supposed to be on. I can see how that would be really important to keep in mind as you're dealing with it with your husband too, because even if he's not specifically going and looking for things and seeking things out, if things are popping up when he's just doing his normal day-to-day -day thing, of course, that's going to be a huge temptation. And of course, you know, there's no excuse for sin and all that, but that would be so difficult. So just having a little bit of understanding and grace in that area. Um, but as we close up today, is there anything else that you wanted to share? I want to know there, you guys to know that there is always hope. And I have seen some pretty 
despairing situations and where you, I am listening to women and I'm like, I just do not know how this is going to end. And just praying and asking God like for some miraculous intervention. And you would not believe the healing and the, I mean, it just miraculous work that God can do if we will give him time, give him access to our hearts, give him access to our wounds to just invite him into um, every room in our hearts. Now it can be really hard work to just keep your mouth shut about like, and by keeping your mouth shut, I mean, not, um, not heaping shame on your spouse. I mean, not saying demeaning things, not going, you know, just deconstructing into a rage, but to engage positively and let God do that hard work of healing. Because unfortunately, as wives, we can't heal our husbands. Only God can heal our husbands. And unfortunately, we cannot say, yes, God, heal my husband, because your husband has to say, heal me. But I want you to, um, so much happens behind the scenes in your relationship between your spouse and God. And we don't always physically get to see that play out. And so just holding on to the hope that God promises to finish what he starts and that he is doing a good work. And at any moment, if he wants you out of that relationship, because there are relationships that are very unsafe. There are relationships that will not, um, because of the, the stubbornness of your spouse, like he just, some people choose and say, no, God is not going to heal me. But I think that God gives us an out in those situations. I've been, um, I've also witnessed relationships where God says, yes, you need to leave for a little bit. And then sometimes they reconcile and sometimes they don't. So I just want to say like, if you're in an abusive situation, then don't just wait. If you, does that make sense? Um, really seek God. And if God says, yes, you have permission to leave, then, then go. But there are a lot of times when it, it looks dark and it looks hard and God says, I want you to stay and um, I will protect you and I will go before you. So it's, it really, um, that's why I think it's so important for you to be plugged in to Jesus so that you know, um, God knows the circumstances. He knows what's going to happen in the end and, and we don't. So being in tune with him and um, holding on to hope, but also really heeding his voice is super important. And so one of the things that we um, developed, Craig and, and me together, Craig and I, whatever, <laughs> were these uh, prayer packs of cards. And there are 52 prayer cards in this deck. And they all are different themes of things that we need prayer for in our marriage. And so there is the, the prayer point. That, like one of them is um, sexual purity and or I think, or physical intimacy. Anyway, there's a theme and then there's a scripture that relates to that theme. Then there's prayer points that you can pray and then an action item that you can do together. So if you feel like, okay, the, one of the things that I prayed for uh, a year ago was Craig's physical health. So I got my physical health prayer card and I started praying those scenes because it was so easy for me to be judgmental about what he was eating and how he was exercising and all of that. So instead of directing that attention and that negative energy toward him, I was able to actually turn it into positive energy and develop it, like kind of bypass Craig and go through God, right? Because I know that God is for that same thing. And so I think that prayer is just going to be such a lifesaver. It is a lifesaver when you're going through hard things and you so much desire to change in your spouse, but it's just going to take time. You need something to hold on to. And he, in Hebrews, it talks about, um, like hope is, is an anchor to our souls. And that is, it's just our life saver too. It gives, keeps us afloat during that storm. Jen, thank you so much for your willingness to hop on here with us today and just to be so open and transparent and to give us so many actionable tips that we can take going forward. I really appreciate you sharing with us today. Thank you so much. It was such a joy to be on. All right. If you found this interview helpful, you will absolutely want to pick up a copy of Jen's book, Pure Eyes, Clean Heart, A Couple's Journey to Freedom from Pornography. And you're in luck because Jen is giving away a copy of the book plus the prayer cards that she mentioned in the interview to one lucky winner. You can find all of the information about how to enter this giveaway in the description below. So scroll on down, check that out, and make sure that you sign up. 
Also, if you loved this interview and you want to hear more just like it, I am going to be coming back every week with more interviews from really awesome, strong, godly women so that we can dive into what this Christian thing really looks like and how to live that out in our lives with the topics that matter the most to you. So go ahead and subscribe. If you have not already, you can do that right down below. And I will talk to you again real soon. Bye.